Nelson and I are here with another Gen Con preview. Now this is a game that we actually covered on the channel some time ago, quite a while ago when it was on Kickstarter and crowdfunding. It is now coming to the world via retail and via Capstone Games. It's Pagan Fate of Roanoke. And let me just tell you right now, two player, asymmetric, deduction game, with a little worker placement, I would call it. If that doesn't have you already, <laughs> I don't know what will. It's a really interesting deduction game with a lot of mechanisms going on. Yeah, there, there is a lot going on here. And even more so as the game unfolds, which I think we may talk about. Yes. Right now it's the core set, and you come with your pre-built deck. And so think uh, like a living card game, Marvel Champions. You're having a deck that is asymmetric from the other player. But as expansions, you're going to even add deck building into the list of mechanics of this game, which is insane. Like, it's a big game. Yeah, and like uh, Nelson said, the base game here doesn't have any of that deck building, but there are going to be additional pieces of content that come out through the rest of this year. I think there's going to be three drops at certain points later in the year. But what we have here sitting on the table is the base game. We have our decks. We have our roles. I am the hunters in this case. Nelson is the witch. And I will point out right now, this is generally not how you would set this game up to play it. Uh, this board would generally sit in between us, and one player would sit on one side, one player would sit on the other side. But it's largely going to be played across this main line of villagers, because you're going to be interacting with the, these villagers quite a bit. On your turn, you're going to be using your three pieces to place out here, visiting one of the villagers, or to place on one of these actions on your board. Now when you take your turn, you're going to place all three of those pieces and do all of the things and then the other player is going to go. But all the things you can do, and again, we don't want to teach you exactly how to play it, but to give you a sense, when you go out here, you're going to go through a list of an ordered list of things to do. One of the things you can see right now is each of these villagers has an action you can take. But there's more to that because the cards that you're going to ultimately play, some of them will actually enhance some of those characters. This is one. You could play a card, and when you get it into play, it's going to go under the character and offer a little bit more to the action. That's the first thing you're going to do. If there's one of those cards there, you do that. Then you're going to look, and at this part, you're going to add influence to the space. So this one says add two influence to any red card. So I could put two on one red or one on each of these two reds. This is a big part of the game because I'm putting influence out here while you're doing what, secrets, I think? Yeah, this is where the asymmetry comes into play because these, let's call them upgrades to the individual villagers is something that only the hunter can do. And there are positive benefits for the hunter and the negative benefits are implications, yes. I guess, for the witch. And so based on if it affects one player or the other, you would play it on the other side, which is why a lot of this time you're playing face to face rather than yes. kind of sitting next to each other. And the whole win condition is also asymmetric. The hunter is trying to find the true identity of the witch, which is you see all of our villagers, all nine, they're actually uh, mirrored here in a secret deck of cards. At the beginning of the game, the witch will take one of these. This is their true identity, which is what the hunter is trying to find. And then the witch wins if they carry out the ritual on the true identity. And so that's where all of these pieces that we're placing out comes because we need to convert our secrets into favors. And if we have three favors, then we can carry out the uh, ritual on the true identity of the witch while you need to get some evidence to exonerate other villagers and put out these so you can eliminate the true village or the true witch as the hunter. Yeah, so the players are focused on either if you're the witch, trying to get that ritual off, and if you're the hunters, trying to find the witch before that before. happens. And you're going to be putting those pieces out on either side of the board because that's going to allow you to kind of like grow towards, like you said, the evidence for the hunters, the ritual for the witch. If you're not going out to the villagers and taking those actions, because they also, also in addition to putting out these tokens, they'll also allow you to do things like draw cards, play cards, whatnot. But you also have a list of things you can do here. One of mine is to lift an enchantment. The witch can actually <laughs> play enchantments. One of the things that they're going to put out are cards here that kind of have ongoing effects that are not good for me, <laughs> but really good uh, for the me. hunters. 
And one of the things I can do is if I'm really annoyed with that after a couple <laughs> rounds, I can go, you know what, fine, I'm going to lift the enchantment. Now that's gonna cost some, uh, but I can pay that with these little dials here. You're going to be getting, what is this? Influence. Pa influence, this yeah. is the influence to get rid of these cards. Now, I have a few other things I can do here. I can gain some influence, I can draw cards. Uh, I can also exonerate a villager, like Nelson said. If I do that, I'm going to spend, in a normal game, yep. three evidence. We played scenario one, which is kind of a tutorial scenario that speeds things up. But I'm gonna be able to pull one of these cards, see who the witch is not, not show Nelson, so I'm gathering information about who it's not out there. Now, all the while, I can also kind of conclude from the way he's putting out his tokens, who it might be. Because he's trying to put tokens next to the witch so that that's where he can perform the ritual. Now, when we played, he spread, he put a lot of tokens <laughs> here, a lot of tokens there, and a lot of tokens there. Kind of narrowing it down a little for me, while also being able to build things up and which I think is probably maybe the best way to go with the witch. Because you so. need to build one of them up. And if you obviously, if you do the one, <laughs> it's gonna be pretty obvious. But he loaded up a bunch on three, which made it so that I was like, okay, well, it's probably one of those three. Then, as I was exonerating, I was able to get at least one of those three. So I was like narrowing it down. And it makes it a little more interesting than simply just eliminating through exoneration. Yeah. And I will tell you, as the witch player, the more cards that the hunter exonerates, the more stressful it becomes because you don't know if your bluffs are no longer bluffs because you don't know what villagers yeah. have been exonerated. And so if I am trying to bluff Mayor Biggs here and the hunter draws Mayor Biggs, they don't, they're not telling me that. So if I continue to sink resources into that, that's great information for David or the hunter to play as. And yeah. so you, as soon as those exonerations start, as the witch player, you have to start blitzing, and then that just gives more information. And it's a very much a tug of war type game. Yeah, it's definitely a tug of war. Uh, not that this is from the same designer, but Capstone has some other games in their catalog, like Watergate and whatnot, mm. that have a little bit of that similar vibe where you're like fighting head to head and things are going back and forth and there's some mind games at play. And speaking of mind games, <laughs> one of my favorite things to do is when he is, when I pull my exoneration cards up into my hand after he's just put tokens down on someone, it's a little way to potentially get into someone's head and go, oh, oh. did he, <laughs> does he know my bluff? Um, it's a really interesting game in that respect. Now, there's some other things I can do too. One of the main things I can do is eliminate a villager. Mm -hmm. Now, this, I'm spending three of the evidence to just outright eliminate one of them. Now, they have to be ready, and ready is such that there's not another token on them. Like I said, this is kind of worker placement, so if there's a piece out there, they're not ready. If he has one of his pieces there, I can't visit that villager, that sort of thing. But if it's ready, I can just eliminate them by spending, now it's costly. Yep. And when I do, if it's the witch, they have to tell me, yes, you just won the game. If it's not, that card is basically out of commission. I've eliminated it, but I can only do that three times. If I've done it three times and haven't found the witch, <laughs> I've unfortunately killed too many villagers and I lose the game. <laughs> yeah, the, the village turns on the hunter at that point. And like, okay, you're 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 not doing a great job here. The other thing is, is if you do get it incorrect, you lose all of or yeah, you lose all of your clues. Yeah. And that can be so detrimental and it's a really big push for that witch player at that point to really start blitzing the end game. Yeah, like I said, we played the scenario one, which was a bit of a tutorial. It went a little easier on me, I think, as the hunters for sure, because in the standard game, you have to have three clues on the... The favors, yeah. On the witch or the person that you want to eliminate, but you also have to have one clue oh, yeah. on every one of the other villagers. So. In my game, I could kind of like pay attention to what he was doing and not really focus on some of the ones that he wasn't focused on. In a normal game, I have to kind of play in all of the areas at least a little bit before I can go eliminating anyone. Yeah. You know, I think that's, I think thematically representative of like, I'm going around all the villagers and kind of like, I've done my due diligence, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Let's kill this person. Yeah, before you kill one person, you have to check in with everybody. Exactly. Yeah, that, makes sense. That, that just makes sense. <laughs> But you're gonna do this game, like I said, until a few different end game scenarios. Like I said, if 
I kill three villagers and I haven't found the witch, I lose. If he gets the ritual off, I think that's the only way the witch can win. Well, I mean, or unless I lose. lose. Yeah. If I lose, it means the witch wins. <laughs> uh, and then I win if I eliminate the witch before the ritual, which is really the main goal of the game. But this game, I have to say, just to give you a general sense of what's going on here, if you've ever played the game The Fugitive, which is a very tight two-player asymmetrical kind of deduction game, because one is The Fugitive, the other one's The Investigator, and they're controlling information trying to stay away from The Investigator, but the, me the mechanisms in that game are very straightforward and very simple. This game is not overly complicated, but there are a lot of mechanisms for a game like that, mm -hmm. a deduction game like that. To have a worker placement aspect where you're placing on all these villagers, also taking some actions yourself, collecting various resources and spending those various resources to get and accomplish different things towards your end goal. I've not quite seen a what really boils down to a deduction game mm -hmm. with so many rich mechanisms to play with. Yeah, and I would add on to that asymmetric mechanisms. Yeah. The witch plays completely different than the hunter, not only in in-game like victory condition, but the types of cards that I have in my deck are different than hunter. So I have this special token, um, which is my familiar. And if I have a familiar that I have played down here, I get to carry out that effect, whereas the hunter does not have that, but they have their own special locations. So highly, highly, highly asymmetric, and each side plays really fun. I like. I think I prefer the witch because I, mean, I, I like knowing would. all the know. Yeah, yeah. I like I mean, knowing the knowledge, and it feels kind of. I don't want to be left out, but the hunter is also a lot of fun. Yeah, both sides are really interesting, and we did kind of gloss over that. I'm glad you said something. Your player boards have a whole area of mechanisms. I've got not only locations like Nelson mentioned, but I also have these characters that can help me, these allies, and these come into play. A lot of them are ongoing abilities. He has some things that he can trigger off, like he said, his familiars when he places his familiar. And what are these across the top? These are potions. And so these are kind of on, or you're, you're kind of playing them to get a future benefit. Oh, that's so whenever right. you pass out a secret, so if I came here to uh, Hunter Adams, I could place a secret onto one of the red factions or onto one of my potions. And then once I have the requisite number of secrets here with the jar of glibness needs three, I can then trigger that as a free action, and then I get to distribute twice as many secrets while visiting villagers this turn. Yeah, they have very significant powers. All of the cards that you're gonna be playing on your player boards, and I think both sides, at least my side, had some ways of, back to that tug of war, some ways of like, I'm gonna play this immediate card that effectively ruins all the progress that you've made on oh, yeah, that, that was potion. Mean. I didn't like that. Yes, he didn't <laughs> like that at all. But it, it is that kind of game, for sure, where you're like, okay, I'm gonna make a little progress, the other player is going to make some progress. Each player is going to foil each other's progress, mm -hmm. both towards those end goals for both sides. But yeah, if you have any questions at all about this, uh, it is a deduction game that you're not going to want to pass up looking at at Gen Con for sure. They're going to have it there. I don't know. I think they're going to have this. I think they have a play mat. Yep, there's I a play mat and then these upgraded components. So these are actually upgraded components that you see on the screen now. Uh, the normal is kind of a standard cardboard component. And then there's a nice full two-player play mat that you can get. Yeah, so if you're going to be at Gen Con, check it out. Also, if you want to check out more about this game and more about other Capstone games, Nelson over here is actually working for Capstone to some degree where he set up their live streaming system, mm -hmm. uh, streaming from their retail location, right? Yep. Yep, their retail location, which is also connected to their corporate offices. We're doing live streams every other week. And right now, every other of those live streams, so once a month, we're doing different pagan scenarios. So we've done the base game, we've done scenario one. Then our next live stream, we're gonna be doing scenario two. And each one of these scenarios, there are two of them in the core set, and each expansion will has the potential to add more. Changes up the powers and the dynamic, and maybe gives the witch a different win condition, but also the hunter's special powers. And so it's a nice way to kind of shake up the game as you play more and more. And speaking of shaking up the game, it is, like we said, going to have more and more content. Yeah. So there is a deck building aspect to this. So depending on what you're dealing with, what those win conditions are, what the scenario might be, what the villagers may look like, because I think there are some other villagers that may be in the mix with future content. Uh, you're going to be actually going, you know what, I'm going to take these cards out and put these cards in because they're going to have all sorts of different uh, new mechanics and new cards that come in that additional content. But 
Like I said, if you have any questions at all about it, make them in the comments below. We'll get down there and answer whatever we can. Until next time, though, make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then.